Time to get started. So um, thanks everyone for joining us for a discussion on agroecology um, to combat the climate crisis. This is the fourth teaching of the People's Green New Deal series. My name is David and I'm speaking to you from Italy. I'm a member of the Climate Change Working Group of Science for the People and uh, the People's Green New Deal Editorial Collective. This teaching series is made possible through the tremendous efforts from folks of the Editorial Collective of the most recent edition of the Science for the People magazine entitled um, Sorry, is there still an echo? I'm, I'm seeing, no, okay, all right, thanks. So apologies, so the People's Green New Deal uh, and the Climate Change Working Group. So if, if you're interested in getting more involved with Science for the People activities, the Editorial Collective uh, for a future issue of the magazine or the Climate Change Working Group, um, I'll post some links for that uh, in the chat in a minute. There will also be links uh, in the chat to subscribe to the Science for the People magazine and order a print copy of the People's Green New Deal issue. If you do so, thanks for your support. This teaching series is endorsed by the Democratic Socialists of America, the DSA, and the DSA Nationwide Eco-Socialist Working Group. DSA is the largest socialist organization in the United States with over 70,000 members and growing. Current organizing efforts by the DSA include Medicare for All, labor struggles, electoral efforts, and the Radical Green New Deal, which is based on the principles developed by the DSA nationwide um, eco-socialist working group. We encourage you to check out their work and get involved if you can. In this teaching series, we will engage, uh, we'll be engaging from uh, magazine contributors, as well as other thinkers and activists on a wide range of issues intersecting with a Green New Deal, covering labor, energy democracy, agroecology, art and design, as well as looking at international and indigenous perspectives. To stay updated on our teaching series, um, you can sign up at bit.ly slash sftp teachin. I will also post um, a link in, in the chat in a second. You can find as well, you can find also video recordings of past panels um, that we had on our YouTube channel and on our website. Again, links will be, pro will be provided in the chat. And now I want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge the history that is happening um, right now as the US elections unfold. We stand in solidarity with our friends and comrades who are in the streets to fight back the anti-democratic US government and the illegit illegitimate claim of uh, victory by Trump. We all stand by you and your fight all around the globe. And with that, um, I'm going to hand over to our moderator of today's uh, virtual teaching, uh, which is Yvette Perfecto. And she will take it from here, uh, introduce the panelists and um, uh, enjoy the listening. Thanks. Um, thank you everybody for, for coming to this teaching. Uh, my name is Yvette Perfecto and I'm a professor at the School for Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. And uh, today we have a wonderful a group of panelists who will be exploring uh, how agroecology can help cool the planet. Eric Hall Jimenez, Krista Marshall, Katia Aviles Vasquez, and Hilda Morales. And before I introduce our panelists, I want just to say a few words about, about agroecology. Um, essentially, uh, I want to distinguish it from, the, from alternative agriculture or other forms of alternative agriculture. And um, for those of you who are not very familiar with the term, agroecology has been described as a movement, a science and a practice, a movement uh, to transform agricultural production from chemical and, and energy intensive 
uh, systems, uh, input dependent large scale production systems that benefit primarily large corporations and agribusiness to a diverse biodiversity friendly, low external input systems that focus on a dignified livelihood for farmers and making healthy and culturally appropriate food for uh, available for local communities. La Via Campesina, a global peasant movement uh, that has embraced agroecology, states that agroecology has intrinsic dimensions of feminism, anti-colonial, and class struggles. As a science, agroecology strives not only to use ecological principles to understand and design agricultural systems, but also engages in contesting social inequalities as well as environmental damage. And finally, as a practice, agroecology merges scientific and traditional knowledges into empirical practices that conserve agro diversity, soils, wildlife, and more generally nature, and that result in productive systems that can sustain farmers and their communities all over the world. So with that, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Eric Holt Jimenez, uh, who was the executive director of Food First, the Institute for Food and Development Policy. Uh, called one of the country's most established food think tanks by the New York Times, Food First missions is to end the injustices that cause hunger, poverty, and environmental degradation throughout the world. Eric earned a PhD in environmental studies from the University of California at Davis, I mean, I'm sorry, at Santa Cruz, and has a, a, a master's degree in international agricultural development from the University of California at Davis. He's author of uh, author and editor of several books, including Can We Feed the World Without Destroying It? A Food Foodie's Guide to Capitalism. Uh, another book, Land Justice, another one, Food Movements Unite, exclamation point, Food Rebellions, and Campesino a Campesino, as well as many uh, academic and magazine articles and blogs. So with that, I leave you with Eric. Eric? Thank you, Yvette. Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on this panel. Um, and I guess I'll get right to it. I, I just want to say um, I first began to practice and learn about agroecology in the late 1970s with the Campesino Campesino movement. Um, and I worked with for about 25, 30 years. Uh, and it was afterwards which I got my PhD and realized that the work that we were doing was called agroecology. Um, and when I was getting my PhD, uh, I was sitting in a seminar one day, and it was an interdisciplinary program in environmental studies. And we were discussing an article, I don't know if it was by Miguel Altieri or by Steve Gleesman about ecology, and we had conservation biologists and uh, policy people and, you know, very different backgrounds. And when we were through, one of the conservation biologists asked, I just want to know, he said, if agroecology is so great, how come all farmers aren't agroecologists? Um, and no one really had a good answer to that question. And so that question then really directed what became my dissertation research, which I won't get into. But I will address that question today, um, my brief presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. And Okay. So Yvette already spoke about agroecology, but let's start with a question. As you can see it, it's fantastic. Um, but why don't all farmers practice agroecology? So I think what, to answer that question, one has to look at the political economy of the capitalist agricultural system, the capitalist food system. That which is what dominates the world. Um, and so farmers within a capitalist food system have very high fixed and seasonal costs. Um, they have to invest a lot of money up front in order to get uh, a, see a crop in the ground. And in fact, they have to borrow money in order to make uh, those investments um, to buy all the inputs and pay out for all the labor and, and whatnot. The margins for their product tend to be very small. 
So they need to produce a lot of it in order to make a decent living. And they have absolutely no control over prices. Um, prices are set in the world market. Um, and of course, that means that whoever has the most market power is able to set the prices. They also have a problem in that they have land fixity. They can't move their land around. They're stuck with what they have unless they want to sell and buy somewhere else. It's not like other, um, other forms of industry. There's also a problem with the environment. I mean, sometimes it rains, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it freezes. So there are all these environmental risks and hazards. Um, and then there's this tremendous disjuncture between labor time and production time. And this is really key. And what I mean by that is that, you know, a farmer puts a seed in the ground after having invested in all of the inputs to get that seed in the ground, and then has to wait three, four, six, or more months to get a crop. So that means that that capital, that original investment capital is frozen, is not working. And this is really key. Um, so not only does the farmer assume all of the risks, which I just mentioned, um, but they have to sit there with their capital in the ground, um, waiting for the crop and then praying that, you know, they'll have a crop, that the prices will uh, be good and they'll be able to sell it. Um, capital doesn't like this. So these are the barriers to capitalist investment in farming, directly in farm, in, be in being a farmer. So what capital does is very clever. Capital invests in the inputs and capital invests in the outputs, but they don't exactly want to invest in the farming itself. They're very happy. Capital is very happy. The banks for, are very happy to lend the farmers money to do this, but they don't want to engage in the activities. So um, when we talk about agroecology and, and often when we talk about organic agriculture or small farmer or peasant farming, we have to realize that these farmers interface with this political economy of capitalist agriculture. And I'm gonna suggest that this is one of the major barriers to the adaption of, adoption of agroecology on a global scale. Because when you look, what happens is money comes in to the food system at the point of farming, at the point of production. Um, but it comes in for what we call substitution and appropriation. Appropriation of the labor process and the ecological functions means that um, capital comes in offering inputs like the green revolution inputs or GMOs or sustainable in intensification or big data. And anyways, these are commodities which capital sells to the farmer. Um, on the substitution side, post-harvest, the raw materials are then turned into ingredients for food products. And we get processed, frozen food, we have international trade, we have the international feed livestock complex around the world. And then we have the huge um, monopolies of, in the grocery chains, Walmart, Tesco, Carrefour, et cetera. So basically, these are points of extraction of wealth from the point of production, okay? So, Farmers produce the product, create the wealth, and then there's a, there's a process of extraction of that wealth by paying the farmer very little um, and then engaging in substitution and appropriation. Pushing a back against this capitalist form of, um, of a food system, we have traditional farming, um, uh, agroecology, food sovereignty, et cetera which attempt to take back these parts of the food system to decolonize them essentially from capital. Um, but you have basically you have this, this huge pincer movement on the part of capitalist uh, agri-food systems to squeeze the farmers uh, at the point of production and to divorce the relationship between farmers and consumers and between farmers and the environment. What this does, Actually, is it, oh, um, I neglected something also very important. Um, in this political economy of agriculture, what happens is that farmers, they make very little, they have small margins of invest, uh, uh, very small margins of profit for each box or each bushel or whatever it is. Um, and yet they have all these costs and all these risks. So what happens is if the market is bad and they lose, and they go into debt. The following year, they don't cut back on their production. 
they increased their production because they got to recover their losses. And they also increase production even when their, um, the harvest is good because they don't, they're afraid of going broke. So I don't know if you know, I mean, capitalism basically is a system of overproduction, but capitalist farming doubly overproduces because of the precarious position of farmers. So you can see this, this is the world uh, food price index from when we started measuring it in 1900. And you can see that the price goes, of food products goes up around World War I and then comes back down. And then after World War II, you get a tremendous drop in food prices. And that's the Green Revolution. Now, what does that mean? That means that we are overproducing food. And, and in fact, we've been producing one and a half times more than enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet since the post-war the post-war period. Um, until 2008, when, we, when the price of food shot up, but that was basically because of speculation, not because there wasn't enough food. There was still two and a half times more than enough food for every man, woman, and child on the planet as there is today. So essentially there's too much food. And what that means is that farmers' prices are low. The price to the, paid to the farmer is low because there's a glut of the commodity. Um, and what that does is we get a transition, we call the agrarian transition agriculture. So if you look here from 1850 to the present, basically the number of farms grows in the United States, and this is tr true worldwide, until about the 1930s. And then the number of farms begins to drop. But as you look, you can see that the amount of land in agriculture stays about the same. So that means the average farm size goes up. So that means that farmers are going out of business because of all the dynamics I just described, and land is concentrating into larger and larger parcels. And uh, you know, in order to be viable, economically viable, farms have to be huge. Um, now this is in direct contradiction with agroecology, which makes it very difficult for agroecological farmers to compete in global markets. The farmer's share of the food dollar has been shrinking from about 40% in 1910 to around 12 to 15% today. Part of it goes towards marketing, the other part goes towards the production costs. That's the appropriation and substitution that I was talking about. So the farmer's getting squeezed. And this is recognized, this is from the World Bank. Globally, they wanna see this process happen worldwide. So starting with small subsistence holders, they want to sell them cheap inputs so they become semi-commercial smallholders. And then they want to hook them up to the global market um, so they can become commercial smallholders. And then pretty soon they become quote unquote advanced farmers, just like farmers in uh, Europe and the United States and Canada and whatnot. Um, so to do this, basically they contemplate the migration out of agriculture. So the 2 billion farmers would be reduced. Where these 2 billion farmers would go, nobody knows. And we don't have another industrial revolution to sop up all this labor. Um, but this is basically the plan of capitalist agriculture. Um, and to have a few huge farms around the world, maybe 50,000 huge farms around the world. Um, and everybody else has to get out of agriculture. And of course, all of this is contributing to what we call a syndemic, which is a a series of different kinds of pandemics. And one is the pandemic, of course, but also global warming, hunger, malnutrition, um, overconsumption of energy, the loss of family farms, the depletion of freshwater and, and the growth of dead zones. Um, and the industrial food system is really at the heart of all of this. And the root causes of all these problems, I think are basically that we have a very vulnerable system. Uh, which is not at all diverse in terms of what it grows. And it's very uh, susceptible to economic shock and environmental shock and industrial mon monopolization. Um, and it's also uh, being financialized, you know, so basically speculating with our food. And it's based on capitalist overproduction, producing more, driving the small ones out, consolidating um, production in larger and larger hands. Um, through overproduction. And the perpetual solution to all these problems is always to produce more. <laughs> Why? Uh, because as you can see, we need to produce more according to um, the World Bank and, and um, 
the FAO actually and, and uh, the USDA and industrial agriculture by using these efficient technologies. And we know what those technologies are. So the green revolution, the gene revolution, and now the big data revolution, all, these are all commodities which farmers are gonna have to buy in order to compete in the global marketplace. But a lot of us say that the food system is broken um, and we need to fix it by voting with our fork, by buying agroecological products, for example, or organic products, for example. But the food system is not broken. It's working precisely as a capitalist food system is supposed to work. It overproduces, it monopolizes, and it transfers all of the externalities, social and environmental externalities, from industry to society. This has happened before, but you think about the environmental disaster of the Dust Bowl, which helped to usher in the Great Depression and, and, or the, and the economic crash of 1929, where there was almost a quarter of people are out of work. The GDP had dropped by a quarter. There were over 5,000 bank failures, a third of our farms were foreclosed upon, farmers were a quarter of the unemployed. And this is very important. Farmers lost parity. They used to be able to buy five gallons of gas with one bushel of corn before 1929. After the crash and during the depression, it took them two bushels to buy one gallon of gas. So you see the disparity between uh, uh, food production and, uh, and industrial production right there. So Roosevelt institutes the New Deal to pull us out of the Great Depression, and he starts with food and agriculture and jobs. Um, and with the Agricultural Adjustment Act, he attempts to reinstitute parity. And with the Federal Surplus Commodities Corporation, he attempts to distribute food because there's plenty of food. Farmers are dumping products, but people are too poor to buy the food. So he tries to get money into people's hands tries to get food into people's hands, and he tries to pay the farmers fairly for their product. Um, but I also want you to see that he, that he instituted a number of other things. Because the, the uh, protection of agriculture and of farmers, the re reconstruction of agriculture could not be done in a vacuum with the other aspects of society. Um, and that's what I think we have to think about when we talk about agroecological transitions. We cannot possibly uh, transform our food system uh, in isolation of the larger capitalist system, capitalist system in which it is embedded. And if you look, it was the uh, New Deal was tremendously successful. This is just GDP, GDP. GDP actually grew faster during the Great Depression than it did during the Roaring Twenties once the New Deal was instituted. I want to get back to parity, which is something which the National Farmers Union in the United States has been pushing for. And it, amazingly, not many farmers know what it is anymore, what used to be a political battle cry. So basically, it's, it's a fair price so the farmers can have a dignified livelihood. Why don't they get a fair price now? Because industry doesn't want to pay a fair price. Um, but with parity, agricultural value stays on the farm rather than being extracted. And it can circulate up to seven times in the rural economies. Um, and if you couple it with supply management, in other words, control over production, have quotas, don't let farmers produce too much, um, and, and you index that or you condition that on environmental practices, um, parity can have a tremendous stabilizing effect. And it could be the basis of food sovereignty and a keystone for transformative agrarian reforms. So I think that a Green New Deal um, it's great we're talking about a people's Green New Deal and from the bottom up and it should support agroecology and organics and everything. But if we don't change the basic rules of the political economy of agriculture, um, I don't think that even agroecological farmers are going to have a chance of uh, being viable in the long run through generations. So uh, it's still pivotal to all the changes we need, but we'll need parity pricing, we'll need quotas, which an environment and, and environmentally regulated supply management. In other words, farmer, I will pay you a fair price if you don't produce too much and you have no environmental externalities. I'll be checking your groundwater, uh, for example. I'll be checking the blood of your agricultural workers to see if they're being contaminated with pesticides. And if you pass those thresholds, you don't get the fair price. Um, and the fair price will, of course, establish the price for the rest of the, of the market. Why should farmers sell their products for less when they can sell them for more um, under a quota system? We need to buy out the CAFOs. 
which is a, for, a, a type of land reform. And we have to return to livestock and diversified family farms um, on diversified family farms. And we need contract reform for farmers' rights and cooperatives to negotiate fair contracts with buyers. We need antitrust measures. We need to break up the monopolies. Um, and um, we really need to incentivize the photosynthetic drawdown of greenhouse gases. And these are the incentives for agroecological process, pro, uh, practices. They could be tax incentives, they could be direct cash payments, and we need to internalize the externalities. Polluter pays. And that would immediately level the playing fields. The CAFOs would not be able to compete with the agroecological farmers um, if they had to pay for what for all the pollution and the water waste and, land, and the land use change. In order to do this, we'll need a tremendous um, upsurge of uh, social power to create the political will. So farmers are less than 2% of the population in the United States. We have more people in prison than on the farms. They have absolutely no political power, which means we have to establish broad alliances across our society with workers, um, with teachers, with consumers. We have to converge in all of our diversity um, with our in, in indigenous groups and, and with Black Lives Matter. And those who are trying to transform our society need to be our allies if we expect to uh, introduce the types of transformations which will actually give agroecological farmers a chance to um, transform agriculture. And we can have an agroecological transition. So I think that's my time. And I know we'll have, uh, going to hear a lot more about the specifics of agroecology from other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, can you unshare your screen? Great, thanks. Okay, so um, we're gonna proceed and then we're gonna have the questions toward the end. And I want to introduce you to Krista, Krista Marshall. She is currently a PhD student in California, studying agroecology through collaborations with researchers, farmers, and extension spe specialists. She was drawn to agroecology because of its foundation, foundations in, uh, in food sovereignty as the basis for reconnecting people with our food uh, productions and the ecosystems that support them. When not absorbed by the complexities of agriculture, she enjoys exploring the cultural, historical, community building, and healing powers of the foods that end up in our plates. And with that, I want to ask uh, Krista to unmute and let us know what she thinks. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you, Eric, for the insightful overview of the political economy um, around food systems. I will share my screen. All right. And um, we're all good, everybody can see. Okay, so for the next 10 or so minutes, I'm gonna provide a brief and broad overview of some of the foundational concepts involved with agroecology, um, and particularly focus some of the examples um, and implications of that on United States agriculture. So as Yvette and um, Eric talked about uh, earlier, agroecology is built uh, very broadly around these three pillars. Um, there's the, the knowledge of our agriculture and food system, the ways that we create and the many ways that we create knowledge and understanding of the way that we grow food. Um, and the way that we build this knowledge offer also offers us uh, an opportunity to reconcile our relationships between how we produce our food and the health of ecosystems and the livelihoods of those who grow and consume food. Uh, at the foundation too, and I think most importantly, agroecology is a movement. Um, it's a movement that directly counters industrial food systems as Eric talked about. And it also offers us an opportunity to, to facilitate movements towards food sovereignty. And, and I think too, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to recognize not only the multitude, but the diversity of roles that our environments, agriculture, as well as food play in, in our lives. 
And finally, we build this knowledge and this movement together to, to create practices. Um, these are sets of principles that very broadly guide the design and management of our agricultural landscapes across the United States in particular um, in, the, in this context. Um, and th these practices sit at the foundation of opportunities for us to support uh, ecosystem and human health in our working productions as well as the opportunity for agriculture to play a pivotal role in mitigating um, human-derived climate change and the consequences of that. And so when we think about the creation of knowledge about our agricultural landscapes and our food systems, um, historically the, the creation of knowledge has sat um, both in you know, institutional sciences and academics um, covering a variety of disciplines, but, but very importantly in um, the observations and the knowledge gained from those who live in and around agricultural and natural landscapes, those indigenous farmer, farm laborers and land stewards who have for centuries created knowledge um, about agroecology and the principles that guide these systems. So these principles lie in the idea that we recognize that agriculture and farms sit within very large ecological networks, right? That the farm, at a farm scale, this sits within a region, within a nation, within the globe. Um, we also recognize that these farms are subjected to the biogeochemical cycles that also govern ecosystems um, in, in a region and beyond. Uh, as Eric mentioned also, these principles lie in this idea that we harness solar energy to enhance photosynthesis across our agricultural landscapes. Um, enhancing photosynthesis offers us opportunities to uh, have agriculture play a role in sinking atmospheric carbon in plant biomass, but also in, in the form of soil carbon. And building soil carbon is also critical to this idea that we build healthier soils in our agricultural landscapes. Historically, industrial agriculture in the United States is continued um, to degrade soils to the point um, which they are no longer able to support those critical functions that are um, essential for crop productivity, as well as the cycling of water and nutrients um, in and beyond our agricultural landscapes. We also want to build these kinds of synergistic partnerships in the ways that we design cropping systems. For example, um, the squash uh, beans maize rotation and the meal power three sisters is a common example of this idea that we uh, strategically pair crops together so that they can build a synergy for their productivity and health. And finally, and I think most importantly, this idea of diversification. Um, as we know, the industrial food system necessitates uh, increasing movement towards monocultures um, and mechanization. And in contrast to that, diversification allows us to to grow a multitude of crops in a landscape, as well as ask questions um, about a transition towards moving animals back into those cropping systems. And diversification importantly can take place over time. So within seasons or, or annually, it also takes place, place spatially um, across these landscapes, moving from a monoculture, a homogeneous agricultural landscape to a more heterogeneous landscape um, with diverse um, cropping systems taking place. So fundamentally, agroecological principles that drive these systems stand in direct contrast to industrial agriculture. And these principles help us to not only repair agriculture's relationship with natural ecosystems, it also offers an opportunity for us to harness the multifunctionality of ecosystem processes to reduce the need for external interventions and inputs um, of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and other agrochemicals that are the foundation of industrial agriculture. So when we think about uh, moving into the practice, building on the knowledge and the movement, agroecological principles can be applied to management and design that crosses many scales. So when we think about the plot, we think in the field itself, we can use um, a mixture of crops or a variety of crops, um, as well as thinking about introducing livestock into those fields. Um, we can introduce crops that support crop nutrition through the biological fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. Um, example of that is legumes. We can also integrate crops and animals to better utilize the landscapes that we currently have. And finally, diversifying these crops within the field offers us to not only enhance our land use, but also provides um, more diverse resources for those beneficial organisms that can support things like the regulation of 
agricultural pests. Uh, we can enhance the living roots that are um, necessary to support the biological activity that underpins healthy soils and the cycling of carbon and nutrients from the atmosphere um, and, over, and support an overall increase in biodiversity in our agricultural landscapes. And if we move to the field scale, we can think about um, larger designs and, and the spatial design of our landscapes, um, as well as the temporal design, we can think about a crop rotation. So what we're rotating in seasons or across annual um, timescales, these rotations can help potentially disrupt those disease and pest cycles um, that are common in industrial systems and managed through the use of pesticides. Um, and this supports crop health through um, natural ecological processes. We can also use cover crops during the seasons in which we're not growing commodity um, or crops for consumption. And that helps us to protect soil from degradation through erosion or um, the impacts of um, rainfall in the winter seasons, as well as support biological activity through the incorporation of living roots. And finally, if we, if we back up a little farther to the field, we can think about um, hedgerows and buffers, which are these natural plantings at the boundaries of fields and in agricultural landscapes um, that help us to support, again, those beneficial organisms through increases in the resources and the habitats available um, to them, as well as physically intercepting um, surface runoff and, and any pollutants that are potentially um, use, being used in agriculture um, during times in which there are intense precipitation events, et cetera. And finally, um, we can think about the landscape scale um, and the design of our landscapes. We can think about the importance of managing the riparian corridors that commonly transect agricultural landscapes um, and to support the enhancement of these water cycles and the reduction of potential pollutants that might be entering those water, those surface waterways. We can also think about the reforestation and restoration of natural areas in and around agricultural landscapes um, as a means to both harbor um, habitats and resources for beneficial organisms as well as wildlife um, and an opportunity to um, sink atmospheric carbon into those um, less disrupted um, areas within agriculture. And I think this is an important one. I think about this a lot, but also if we think about um, the opportunity for expansion into urban landscapes um, and the production of food in urban areas as an opportunity to decrease the pressure of production on our rural and working lands. And so when we think about the components of these agroecological systems, it's very obvious that it necessitates a movement. Um, realizing these systems that fundamentally support ecosystems and, and human health and livelihoods first necessitates a movement that recognizes the socio-political and economic nature of our current food system. And it also offers us an opportunity to interrogate, as Eric pointed out earlier, um, who currently owns and controls the fate of our food. Um, and, and like he said, it's very obvious that the, the majority of, of the activities around both the production, the distribution, and the consumption of food lies in the hands of a very small amount of multinational corporations. And so, Realizing agroecology will require us to prioritize larger movements towards food sovereignty, as well as envisioning a more radical transformation of the current food system that we have. So food sovereignty, I think, is also a really good example of, um, of embodying all the pillars of agroecology. Um, it's the right of all peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food that's produced through these agroecologically sound methods. It's a right for all of us to define our own food and agricultural system. And it centers those who produce, distribute and consume food, um, which is in contrast to the current system in which markets and corporations dictate how we produce food and how we consume it. And so centering food sovereignty in a transformation of our food system very easily facilitates movements towards agroecological farming systems. Um, so we think about the localization and regionalization of food systems. Um, we also think about how to localize and regionalize, we need to deconsolidate, democratize, and decolonize our agricultural lands, resources, and food supply chains. Uh, a localization and regionalization also necessitates a diversification of agricultural landscapes, the crops, and also the role of livestock in, in our working lands. And also urban lands too. And I included this example from my city of Sacramento. Um, there is over 15 acres in a small community 
that is dedicated to producing agroecologically sound food um, to not only increase food access, but also address socio-political and economic issues around um, indigenous foodways, um, anti-incarceration, and providing opportunities for refugee farmers to grow and consume culturally appropriate food. And finally, it's also a time for us to hold our governments accountable um, and to move towards reflecting support for food sovereignty and agroecology in both the regulations and legislations that come from city to county to national levels. And I'll leave it with um, a, a reflection for us that food sovereignty is also an opportunity for us to stand in solidarity and not in competition. Um, we stand in solidarity for not only the well being of people, but the well being and long term longevity of our environments that support food pr production and the health of the earth. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Krista. Wonderful. Uh, moving on, uh, so that we have enough time for questions, I want to introduce you to uh, Katia Aviles Vasquez. And Katia holds a PhD in geography from the University of Texas at Austin, where she studied uh, the cultural and political ecology of small scale farmers in Puerto Rico. Her research highlights community based adaptation and engages in topics from a grassroots activism perspective to both continually test its validity and increase its reach. She has co-authored more than a dozen articles, book chapters and technical reports, including organic agriculture and the global food supply. And after Hurricane Maria, she has refocused her work on local capacity building in the distribution of resources for local entities, securing more than 10 uh, million. <laughs> for projects by and for Puerto Rican residents. Her work has been uh, highlighted in local and international news outlets, and she has received the EPA Environmental Champion Award, as well as ESF Graduate of Distinction Award. And I'm very proud to say that she's a former student of mine. <laughs> so Katia, take it on. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, perfect, all right. And I am incredibly honored to have been Yvette's student as many other women in agroecology in Latin America have been. So thank you Yvette for opening our eyes and helping us through the process. So um, hopefully, hopefully I am sharing my slides. Let me see here. And when Katia. you see it, you, uh -huh. Sorry, just a moment. There's some whistling in the background. I don't know if this is um There's coquis in the background. They're the coquis. Gotcha. Those are the coquis. Okay. So they're going to accompany us <laughs> throughout the presentation. Sounds that good. It's something very, very beautiful and typical here so that they're lulled me to sleep every night. Um, okay, so do you guys see my presentation or my notes? Presentation? Presentation. Perfect. All right. So just to give you a glimpse, that's what the Puerto Rican archipelago on your screens. And I'm going to give you just a brief glimpse. I wish I had the calmness of Krista and Eric. I don't. I tend to speak very fast and I apologize beforehand. So I've taken the habit of starting my all, all of my presentations talking a little bit about positionality and about me and the work that I, that I do and that we do together. The first caveat or, or thing to, to state is that my income, I'm a working stiff, so I, I work during the day and then kind of put on the role of activism at night and during the day and, and you know, between midnight and 5 a.m. And a lot of my work has focused on disaster recovery post-2017. But what you're going to see in the next few minutes has been collective work and a lot of thank yous from Organización Boricua, Proyecto Agroecológico Los Cobravo, Huatia Colectivo Agroecológico, more than 35 agroecological projects that are under the umbrella of Instituto para la Agroecología or the Agro Institute for Agroecology, which has been created since 2018 as a shield or umbrella for agroecological projects to either survive the state or be able to someday take it over. Um, and more than 300 participants directly working with agroecological projects and part of the agroecology school. 
as well as the support of the Climate Justice Alliance, Proyecto de Ciudad, El Puente Elac, particularly Marisa Reyes, the Maria Fund, Why Hunger, and Saulo is also here with us. Thank you, Saulo. Grassroots International and Ayuda Legal Puerto Rico have also supported this work. And again, it is not mine, it's a collective effort. Many of you know Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico right after Hurricane Irma, exactly two weeks after Hurricane Irma. And the devastation was such not only because of the strength of those two hurricanes, but because Puerto Rico was the showcase of the Caribbean for a capitalist social experiment in which the US needed its Caribbean colony to be the countermeasure, the counterweight to the Cuban workers revolution that was cooking up in the Caribbean and they could not have two examples of successful revolutions, Haiti and Cuba happening in their backyard. So Puerto Rico was hit with a lot of different economic incentives, particularly section 936 in order to promote the industrialization of Puerto Rico as an economy, but also its agriculture and Eric already touched upon how that was done particularly with the green revolution. So when the hurricane hits, it hits an island and an infrastructure that has been riddled with austerity measures since the Section 936 tax breaks of the industrialization ended in the early 2000s. And the impact of that disaster was then after almost a year without electricity, no water and no healthy food, then we had the earthquake swarm that started in December 2019. So if you think your 2020 has been screwed up, boy, ours has not, did not even start. I'm still in 2019. So we had the earthquake swarm of 2019 to present and the housing or shelter instability that that generated, particularly in the Southwest region of the island of Puerto Rico, the big island of Puerto Rico, led to a scarcity of farm labor. And it's important to note that while the press here in Puerto Rico focused on the fact that people did not meet, where people were not up to the strength and rigors of farm labor, they did not once mention the fact that farm laborers do not have minimum wage, do not have any support structure or incentives. Actually, some of them lose their incentives if they work as part of farm laborers and they have no access, real access to land. Actually, part of my research that even mentions shows that Puerto Rican, particularly Puerto Rican youth, are very willing to work in agriculture as long as they have their land, as long as they're working for themselves, their family, or their community, not as slaves for the owner of the land. And that's really important because that never hits the press. So then after that, we have a saying here in Puerto Rico, cuando no es sequía es huracán. When it's not a drought, it's a hurricane. If it's not a drought, it's a storm. So we had the drought of 2015, and we came out of that drought in November 2015 with actually floods. Then we have Maria and Irma in 2017, and then we had the earthquakes 2019, but we had the drought again in 2020, a major drought, and tropical storm Isaias destroyed in 2020 the southeastern planting production. Most of those conventional farmers that had no structure within their, within their um, crop, their planting structure, within the plantains. And that goes to what Christo was talking about in terms of how do we use the biology and ecosystem functions as a way to resist the storms in the future. So we've been hit for the five, past five years over and over and over with extreme natural events and disasters that have been then compounded by public policy, disaster upon disaster. So the disaster recovery funds that are supposed to help people out of, in this case, particularly Hurricane Maria, have been given an agribusiness focus. So all that Eric was talking about, of we need to produce more, we need to make more and make more and make more and scale up, has been the focus agribusiness. They, it has completely disregarded the fact that the requisite of these funds is that 70% of them have to go to 80% of the low middle income population. And the only way to access, now that we have COVID on top of everything, is through an internet portal where you can ask questions and do the application. Just to give you an idea, only 24% of the farms in Puerto Rico have internet access. So it begs the question, who is this support really from? Or, I'm sorry. And then you have COVID-19, which forced a government shutdown, shelter in place, directives for those that were lucky enough to have a shelter, prohibition of farmers markets all across the archipelago, and policies that locked farmers in poverty, the poverty treadmill that Eric already talked about, 
particularly no polyculture is recognized in policy, in agricultural policy in Puerto Rico as part of following the US agricultural policy. So that has had a huge impact on coffee culture. And Yvette Perfecto, along as well as Miguel Antoledo, have written a lot about that. And you can look for it a little bit further later on, and we can talk about it in the Q&A. And then, of course, representation matters. Agricultural incentives, since recent years, I can't remember when it shifted, started to be tied only to volume of production in terms of dollars and cents. And in the past five years, which started in 2015 with, with the worst drought that we have had in many, many, in, in a, I think it was the worst drought in the century, tied to agricultural production, then you have most farmers are not able to evidence that they are in fact farmers because production has been low or non-existent. All that they have been able to focus on has been tending, stewarding the land that they are on. Like Eddie said, you're tied to the land, you can't really move to it. And I wanted to show you here the Utuado Lares section or sectors of Puerto, Puerto Rico have 36 of the total farms, but only 10% of the dollar value of production. Whereas Arecibo and Ponce have only 19% of the farms, but they have 54% of the production value. And those are the ones that get the incentives and those are the ones that get a say in public policy. Again, to give you an idea, when the COVID incentive packages for agriculture came in, most of the agricultural products in Puerto Rico were actually excluded. And it took up to this news articles from November. So it took from March to November of heavy lobbying to be able to include coffee as part of the recovery package when you have most of the farmers have some type of coffee production. And then on top of that, Obama, in his last gift of democracy to Puerto Rico, actually created the Fiscal Oversight Board, which has put the interests of bondholders above the interests of our children and our future. More than 200 schools have closed and shut down in Puerto Rico. We have a health system that's about to collapse. And in all of this, now we have the National Academies of Science and the Food Forums talking about resilience, and resilience is the way to go. Well, speaking as someone that survived Maria and the earthquakes and everything that has come since, along with many other Puerto Ricans, resilience at the end of the day is for those that survive. And if that is what we're going to talk about, then we need to stop the hypocrisy there. Um, there is a need for redundant backup systems, and this is something that Salvador was talking about in his presentation. How many pieces can we take up before collapse? And the reality is that public policy in Puerto Rico and following, of course, copying US policy like Trista had, has highlighted, actually has consistently eliminated those backup or redundant systems. So who practices agroecology in Puerto Rico? In Puerto Rico, the average age for agroecological practitioners is 40 years old compared to conventional farmers, which is 61. 60% 60 of agroecological projects are direct production, whereas it's for the family or the community, animal raising. Most of them are less than 15 cuerdas, or 15 is an equivalent to acres. And in Puerto Rico, the average conventional farm has actually increased size, where you have 4% of the farmers have 40% of farmland production in their pocket. And then 40% of the other agroecological projects are actually not food center. They're the support system around the food production that is so essential. And we're talking about education, whether it's at the school formal location level or outside the school, campesino a campesino, non-formal education, community gardens, food preparation, agritourism, like um, Ocio Creativo, Creative Ocio, and Saulo will try to translate later, agritourism, sustainable construction, and water and energy production or harvesting. This is just to give you an example of the importance of those community networks that have come to the fore in the past three to five years of disaster upon disaster and public policy against us, which has been, this is just a couple of hours in the morning and then late in the early in the afternoon, same farm, just one day of work with one of our work brigades. The same way why one cannot value enough how important it was for Puerto Ricans and how it is, how important it is for farmers in general to be able to go into the forest and get the water that we couldn't get when you opened the faucet, get the water that you needed for your baby and not having them starve like, like it happened to many of us. So being able to have that polyculture is essential and that's actually one of the things that helped farmers survive in Puerto Rico after 
when other farmers starved in their land because there was no energy in order and they had nothing but the monoculture that the state forced them to have. Five weeks after Maria, we had agricultural production back in most agroecological projects, very important. They were able to actually sell part of it and give part of it to the community kitchens that came up right after the hurricane as community support centers. You can see here some of the banks that were lifted up after the hurricane and what we call food deserts. Densely populated urban areas were able to take the debris and actually turn them into nutrients for a very degraded soil and it became food for those community kitchens after the hurricane. The same after the earthquakes. After the earthquakes, where the government actually focused on hiding away the resources, agroecological projects not only gave physical and emotional support to the ad hoc tent camps that came up all over the Southwest region, but actually linked them to local farmers, conventional or not, so that they could get access, ready access to safe and healthy food. And our COVID response has been multi-tiered. One of them has been there's most agroecological farmers are not recognized by the state. So when you went out during the state, the shelter in place and the government shutdown, actually police stopped our farmers and some of them were cited for um, tribunal given multas. Um, I'll remember the word later. So we created workshops, we created easy to follow instructions such as this flyer that you see here to our right that has been used throughout Latin America through the Via Campesina. And we had to have a legal support team on call with us. Luis Jose Torres Asensio and Ed Martinez of Proyecto de Ciudad were with us accompanying through the process and writing letters to explain to cops and to the state that ox driven food, um, soil preparation is part of the food cycle because all of the executive orders, public policy focused on food distribution chain not on the actual food production and land stewardship. The same with the farms, they were able to lean on alternate economic exchanges that they already used, but then they had to completely do away with the supermarket and were able to use completely those alternate economic exchanges. They were able to alter alternate their distribution chains, already a short chain, and that's something that has been discussed in other fora. But the coolest thing about this thing was that it was a non-exclusive response. The response was not, I'm an agroecological farmer and too bad for you. It was actually a community response. Those agroecological farmers within their communities become became the way for conventional farmers to get some of their products out. They were, hey, you know, do you need me to move your plantains? I know you're not selling to the food supermarket anymore. Should I include it in the food box? And food boxes and community supported agriculture has boomed since the COVID. And I know that's a pattern that's similar to the US. What was unique about the agroecological response of farmers, the speed and capacity to shift. El juego de pies is a boxing term of shifting your feet quickly. And agroecological farmers have that, whereas conventional farmers are stuck in a process that doesn't support them or help them. And how much the response was both interwoven and did not expect anything from the state. Why is this important in terms of climate? Climate, the Caribbean islands, islands in general, Caribbean islands in the tropics or the tropics are gonna be facing those climate change shifts even more strongly than other areas. We have increased vulnerability due to the chains of colonialism that we're dragging, particularly the way that the economy is built. There's a public policy disconnect. And here, for example, one of the things that I wanted to show you those food boxes that I talked about as a response were actually um, co-opted by the government. The government decided to pay $90 per box to a private um, company to distribute these boxes. Economic development in terms of dollars and cents is being used as a proxy for well-being. And lastly, what do we need? I like to close every, all the time with what can we do? What's our homework after this? talk. One, we need to scale out, but we need to scale up. We need to do those. Right now we're doing a CDBG funding campaign with Ayuda Legal, y debajo, Acer, Can Bartolo, Can Hilares, and a, a whole bunch of other groups to get access to the funding that farmers need to shift public policy because the more we can reduce the pressure to survive, the more likely we are to adopt ways to be more resistant and then resilient. And then of course, getting resources, getting access to land, to seed and to capital. When I talk about capital machines, whether it's a shredder, something to 
a kitchen table, community, knowledge exchanges that are not only campesino a campesino, but community to community. We're talking about Cuba and Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, San Croix and Vieques being able to exchange how they manage, for example, Cuba managed Irma through a plantain integrated, multi-layered structural plantation type of system and research. I thank you guys and I thank David for the, for the invitation to open these spaces for local knowledge, local research and collaborations that are both with and for local needs rather than trying to be either saviors or the objective scientific mind. And with that, I again, thank you everyone and look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Katia. Wonderful. And uh, so let's move on then to our last speaker. And our last speaker is Helda Morales. Helda is professor uh, in agroecology and sustainable food systems at the Colegio de la Frontera Sur, a research center in San Cristobal de las Casas, Chiapas, Mexico. She conducts research on how to scale out agroecology while working with teachers, urban farmers, women organizations, and farmers markets. Helda. Hi, how are you? Thank you for this uh, invitation and letting me uh, share our experience here in uh, Central America. Uh, I will share, share my PowerPoint. So now, uh, just uh, I will ask you to uh, imagine that uh, you are living in the United States or Italy, wherever you are, <laughs> are coming here to, to the tropics in the highlands where I live and I work. Uh, this is a picture of the milpa that um, some of you were mentioning. And uh, for me, the, the milpa, the traditional Mayan milpa, uh, is uh, the perfect example of uh, what uh, agroecology should be in practice. This polycrop that provides us uh, with food, uh, perfectly nutritious, and at the same time protects the environment. Um, I will talk uh, a little bit about how this uh, perfect uh, agroecology system uh, has provided us um, with um, food with uh, ecological uh, services like pest management and uh, specifically how this uh, milpa uh, can help us um, uh, mitigate climate change. So uh, part of my initial work in agroecology with uh, Yvette Perfecto uh, show how this uh, traditional milpa uh, is uh, almost uh, free of pests because of the way that uh, farmers had uh, designed this system and also in the way that the, the traditional fertilization process uh, made that the plant defend themselves and attract natural enemies like uh, this wasp that um, is um, eating this um, uh, fall armyworm that is a problem in many other systems where the corn is planted in monocrops or where it's fertilized with synthetic fertilizers. Um, and uh, also it's very important that uh, the work of uh, my colleague uh, Hugo Perales that has shown that uh, despite all the public policies and the international agreements, people here in the highlands of Chiapas and Guatemala preserve the corn varieties because these new varieties uh, cannot compete with the traditional corn varieties. Uh, imagine in this uh, uh, land where in one piece of um, 
the hill, we have a very specific climate and in the other one, a completely different one, and also with small patches of different kinds of uh, soils. Uh, these um, new varieties that have been developed in, um, uh, in research centers uh, or uh, by the industry cannot, um, cannot compete with these ones that are specialized for our region and also for our tastes. And um, many, many years ago, um, uh, agronomists like uh, Efrain Hernandez X from, El Colegio, from um, Chapingo, El Colegio de Postgraduados or Steve Glisman have documented how these traditional varieties and the way that people farm them can um, uh, like um, uh, survive when droughts are very strong or when heavy rains uh, maybe will uh, drop down the new varieties. So we have a treasure here and a treasure that uh, is in the hands of farmers and in the knowledge. It's not just uh, uh, a question of uh, put these seeds in a bank, uh, is a question of uh, respect and acknowledge the deep um, knowledge of um, traditional indigenous farmers in this region. Unfortunately, since the, since the 60s, 70s, uh, in almost every little town in Chiapas and Guatemala, you can find uh, the agrochemicals, especially herbicides, and also uh, the government is constantly pushing for them to use synthetic fertilizers. And um, especially in times of elections, uh, small farmers are given uh, a package of uh, seeds of um, these uh, new varieties, uh, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides. Um, but I will concentrate uh, my talk in this region of the dry corridor in Central America that goes from Chiapas to Panama. Um, and that's where my student, uh, Nathan, Nathan Abinder, um, is working, especially he's working in Rabinal in the Baja Verapaz area, a region where constantly uh, had been uh, attacked uh, by the military, many massacres in the 80s uh, happened there. Um, but uh, Nathan has been able to tell a story of survival and uh, on how agroecology is growing there despite all the problems that these people have to confront. And I think that um, it's very interesting to uh, acknowledge what is happening in this dry corridor. Uh, because um, since uh, the 2015, 27% of the families in Guatemala are in need of food assistance in this, uh, in this area. Um, and since 2020, 2012, I'm sorry, um, only in 2017, um, they had have an average rainy season. Um, in 2018 and 2019 um, were catastrophic uh, with periods of 25 to 30 days without rain, especially during that rainy, during the planting season of the corn. So that's why that in 2018, 76% of the corn harvest was lost. Uh, all over the region, you could see um, a landscape like this, uh, especially a, when uh, conventional um, corn was, uh, was planted. Um, so that's why that uh, one million and a half people in Guatemala need now food assistance. And um, people in food insecurity migrate 38% more than the rest of the population. So just among the deported people in the United States, there is more and more farmers 
um, that are, had been from Central America that have been deported. Um, in 2009, farmers were 31% of the deported people in the border. And in 2015, 53% of the deported were farmers. Um, nevertheless, there's always uh, hope and resistance from the Achi people, the Mayan uh, indigenous people from Baja Vera Paz. Uh, despite all the racist policies from the Guatemalan government, uh, despite uh, the war, the massacres, despite um, the climate change, people persist and they still continue, many of them, to plant the traditional ancestral milpa, like this one, where they plant uh, corn, beans, squash, and many, many other greens. And um, many times the ancestral milpa is a agroforestry system, like uh, this one from Alfredo Cortes that uh, plants uh, trees, um, many bushes and um, roots, um, like more than 50 species in his um, small plot. Um, and like him, uh, like Alfredo Cortes, Cortes from Jeshiwan, uh, part of his um, co-op, 40 plots are grown in this, uh, in this style. And uh, agroforestry may be a new word for them, but not uh, the practices. These practices are ancestral. And this group is taking more and more proud of uh, being able to grow their food like this. Uh, they know that um, the practices prevent soil erosion. Um, if there's a bad uh, weather, there's, there's um, draw or too much rain, they have something to eat. If they lose the corn, they will harvest the cassava or the malanga, that is a kind of root that um, provides uh, a good calories um, and they inter besides the intercropping uh, crops with trees uh, they also produce their uh, pigs and um, chickens and turkeys uh, some of them have cows that they use also um, as fertilizers and also many of them have ponds with fish and snails uh, one of the things that uh, Nathan, my doctoral student, have documented is that they don't fight weeds. They know that weeds are the allies, uh, that they protect the soil against erosion, that they provide also um, good organic matter, uh, and also that the trees are the allies because they are able to uh, pump uh, nutrients and water from uh, the deeper layers of the soil. So uh, despite these horrible uh, seasons of draw in the dry corridor of Central America, farmers like Alfredo Cortez have been the only ones to be able to harvest the corn this year. So that's a, a evidence that how agroecology can help us um, uh, survive despite climate climate change. This is another picture of his uh, system where he also plants flowers and um, many uh, herbs that they use as, uh, as medicines or to repel bugs. Um, nevertheless, um, this is the exception. Uh, because of, as I told before, of all the government policies that don't respect, that don't even uh, know uh, or acknowledge these traditional farmers' practices. And um, as uh, Eric was telling us at the beginning, um, that's one of the questions that we are trying to answer now in our research group uh, here at El Colegio de la Frontera Sur. 
if uh, agroecology is so cool, why is that only uh, 100 farmers maybe in Ravinal are still practicing uh, the traditional ancest ancestral agriculture that we call agroecology now or agroforestry? And um, I agree with what uh, Eric was uh, saying about the reason why uh, we are not uh, having been able to uh, expand agroecology. But I, I also see all the reasons, especially uh, here in this um, region of the world. And I think that one of the main reasons is classism and racism because uh, these farmers that are perceived as um, ignorant because um, they may not have been able to go to a formal school. Uh, so what will they know uh, even if they spend the, the whole day in the farm? Um, many agronomists um, don't uh, consider the knowledge and they are always trying to teach them something new. Um, they speak with a lot of technicism. Uh, they are, don't have the ability to listen to what farmers' needs are. Um, and also because um, they are trying to sell magic bullets to try to fix uh, problems. Um, and uh, of course, that, that's even worse when women are involved because there's a lot of... Uh, machismo in the region and uh, not only in rural areas, but uh, also among uh, agroecologists. Uh, now that uh, finally uh, the government and FAO is uh, telling many, many countries, ah, you should uh, look at agroecology because they have good answers for climate change. Uh, agroecology is the answer for sustainable food systems. Um, so there's a movement growing of many NGOs and many government programs that are starting uh, to promote agroecology. But uh, unfortunately, with the attitudes of the old times, with the attitudes of the Green Revolution, that I'm the technician, I'm the agronomist, I'm the one to know, and I'm gonna tell you what to do. So I'm gonna try uh, uh, to convince these farmers that know a lot about to preserve soil, about how to um, avoid draw to use Bokashi, for example. Uh, and I'm sure that Bokashi is a good uh, technique in Japan, but why to promote Bokashi as a recipe um, for uh, farmers in Chiapas or Guatemala? Or why to recommend uh, to buy microorganisms from a factory when they are maintaining life in the soil in the ways that they grandparents and also in the way that they are constantly experimenting and uh, being able to, har to have good harvests. Um, and also there's another problem that uh, not only in the United States, but in many countries, there's an, it is an attitude of anti-science. Uh, and so uh, even uh, the people that recognize uh, farmers' knowledge, um, they think that academia doesn't have anything to do, that uh, they are erasing the word ecology in agroecology. And um, if we are not able to find that dialogue between farmers that spend days and days for generation in their plots and to be able to dialogue with scientists, with ecologists, um, then I think that agroecology is not gonna find uh, um, and is not gonna become um, the way that we produce uh, in our in our regions. So uh, uh, this is a call, even though maybe it's so far away from what you see in the United States. Um, I highly recommend uh, to look at answers to traditional indigenous people from around the world that may have answers. And when you dialogue with them, please listen. Great, thank you, Hilda. 
And I forget to say that Hilda was also a former student of mine, so I'm very proud of her as well. <laughs> so let's open it up for discussion. I know that we're a little bit late and I want to apologize for that. And um, we're gonna extend the time until uh, for 15 minutes. So until 6.45, uh, those of you who have to leave, we understand. So just, just hop off. Uh, but let's, uh, let's take some questions from the audience. And I have a few questions that I've been collecting. Um, I have a question here. Feel free to start you know, sending questions through the chat. Uh, I have a question from Erica uh, Judelman. And she is asking a question to Eric, I think, and say, how do we anticipate? No, actually, I'm sorry. No, this is uh, Lydia. Let me start with Lydia. Lydia McAnerney. Mac and she's asking the question to, to Eric. And she's asking, how do we get the USDA to do this? And by this, I assume that she's talking about trans, you know, moving toward agroecology, transforming toward agroecology, uh, or do we need to bypass them? So the role of USDA, mm -hmm. Eric? <laughs> okay, so we can't bypass the USDA to change the rules. The USDA and the US Farm Bill sets the price of commodities for the world. Um, and there's no way around them. If, if we're going to actually change the rules to make political economic conditions favorable to agroecology and disincentivize um, industrial agriculture, that I think is the whole point of a Green New Deal, that we need to ensure that parity and, um, and uh, supply management and environmental um, externality, payment for environmental externalities are included in the Green New Deal. Um, I've had lots of conversations with people who work on the Green New Deal about this, and it doesn't seem to penetrate. I mean, I think the Green New Deal is really a, an urban initiative, and um, it's very difficult um, to get them to understand, you know, what the what the the uh, the rules are, which which set the stage for our entire food system. We've got the levers, um, so I think uh, unless there's a massive piece of legislation um, with massive support from the public to create the political will to introduce these changes, um, USDA isn't gonna budge. You know, they may throw some more money at agroecology, um, which is nice, but it's, it's not going to solve the, the problem. So a, a movement for a Green New Deal that really includes parity and, and, and supply management and environmental reform, I think is, uh, and, um, um, uh, antitrust is essential. You're muted, Yvette. So now the question uh, uh, by uh, from Erica Judelman. And she asked, how do we anticipate agroecology being able to handle the increases in extreme weather coming to many agricultural regions? Anyone want to answer that? Any of the speakers? Maybe, maybe uh, Krista, who talked specifically about, about this. Yeah, I could speak a little bit to it. Um, I think that agroecological systems by their nature of being diverse offer us opportunities for redundancy. Um, so if we have not only multiple people growing similar things, but our farmers growing many different products um, that have obviously different um, sensitivities to things like drought or things like flooding, um, it offers us opportunities to have a more resilient food system in the context of more frequent and, and maybe more spor sporadic climate events that are happening. Um, Great, thanks. Thanks, Krista. Um, from uh, Shine uh, Varghese, one of the pilot uh, projects of FAO and agroecology is in Mexico. Does Helda or anyone else know of its operation for the entire state or for, or for some specific region? 
uh, say only in the highlands of Mexico or elsewhere too, uh, or only with specific communities and how is their experience with the pilot project. So anyone has any, any knowledge about this pilot project, FAO projects in Mexico uh, or any specific region of Mexico? And how are the points, uh, classism, parenthesis, you outline in the slide being addressed in this project? I guess this is for Helga. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we are very happy that FAO uh, is uh, supporting uh, Mexico for this trans agroecological transition, they are calling it. Um, and um, it, they help create a committee to uh, make a plan. And so far, that's it. Um, we have a committee <laughs> and um, that is um, like documenting um, all the agroecological initiatives around the country. And there's a lot of discussion uh, because um, there's a conflict uh, right now inside the Mexican government, the Ministry of Agriculture um, Victor Villalobos is a pro-transgenic, pro-fertilizers, pro-pesticides agronomist. Um, one of his big promises is uh, to open a new fertilizer plant in Mexico, and he's pushing uh, for Mexico to start plant um, transgenic corn. Uh, in the other hand, we had uh, Victor Toledo, who was the Ministry of um, Natural Resources uh, and the Environment, who is a well-known agroecologist, and he was in charge of uh, that committee. But uh, a few months ago, um, he left his post, and so we are now very anxious uh, to know what's going to happen. Uh, nevertheless, uh, even in the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, there's, uh, there are many people who want to see agroecology flourish in Mexico. Uh, and uh, they are trying to uh, do what they can. Um, they have already opened some um, agroecological farmer schools around uh, the country. Um, but unfortunately, as, as far as I know, and the people that I have interviewed so far, what they are doing is um, what I was uh, telling you about that is happening also in Guatemala and that uh, Nathan Haven did have documented that um, they are not asking farmers, what do you know, what are your problems? They are offering these um, uh, recipes of uh, alternative agriculture, such as um, bokashis and other, other um, techniques that may work, but uh, are undermining the people knowledge. So imagine here in Mexico where the farmers uh, have protected the corn uh, for generations, uh, even the agroecology schools are uh, like um, giving them answers that um, don't consider their own knowledge. That's what is gonna is happening. So it's also an uh, again an example of racism that they are not considering their knowledge. Thank you, Helga. Um, next question is from Les Levidal. And he's asking, he's saying this, the following, in the global South, especially Latin America, many agroecological producers have been bypassing market competition uh, through short su food supply chains based on solidarity and cooperation. How can those experiences inform similar efforts in North America? What policy support measures would help there? Any of our speakers want to answer that question? Maybe starting with the ones that are in North America, Eric and Krista. Um, I can address that at least partially. Um, well, it is already happening here. I mean, we've had farmers markets here for 30 years. Um, 
and um, you know we have CSAs, we have these short supply chains. The problem is that they're very quickly saturated, um, and there's competition amongst the farmers in the markets, um, and there's competition for um, for boxes and CSAs, um, and so you know. It, it's a it's a partial solution to the problem of overproduction and um, a lack of markets and, and uh, fair prices for agroecological uh, goods. Um, so, I mean, I think that we need to continue to do those things, but I think they, they could be reorganized more along the lines of um, the CSAs and farmers markets in the Basque country, for example, which are run by the Basque Farmers Union, who equity, equitably distribute the CSA boxes amongst their farmers. They've determined how many boxes a farmer needs in order to make a living. And so they actively recruit people to, to buy boxes, but they don't allow one farmer to have more boxes than another farmer. Um, and in fact, when one farmer's, I, I saw this, one farmer's crop was destroyed by the, by the wind. Um, all the other farmers in the farmer's union would donate a box to the farmer so that farmer could keep their clients. And then the clients and the other farmers went out and helped, helped to rebuild the, the uh, farmer's greenhouse, which had been blown down. So a completely different solidarity approach, uh, a food sovereignty approach to CSAs and to farmers markets. I, I worked in California in the early, day, in the early 70s um, with farmers markets, which were run by farmers. And it, it, it doesn't solve all the problems, but I think that the ownership of, of not just the means of production, but the ownerships of the markets by the farmers would go a long way to um, answering the problems which the markets are facing today. And the other side is just, we have to dismantle the, the monopolies. You know, we have to dismantle Walmart, you know, Amazon. I mean. Agree. <laughs> so um, I don't know if Krista has, a anything to say we're running a little bit short on time but if you have anything that you're that you want to add to that no or yes no i think i'm good just you know these agroecological systems exist within the current market structure and so it's you know thinking very high level about what that means to facilitate and change our economic systems mm -hmm. okay so uh another question from andre andre Luis Oliveira Dominguez, uh, and he say that he's a, he has worked on farms in upstate New York and have farmed in Arizona as well. He has read uh, Eric's book and highly recommend it. And his question is the following. He say, I'm interested in getting involved in food sovereignty movements and anti uh, any anti-capitalist organization organizing around our food system. What organizations or processes do you recommend looking forward, for examples? Looking towards, for examples. Anybody wants to give uh, Luis, Andres Luis, a recommendation? Science for the People, great organization doing a lot of great work, including with uh, agroecology and farmers. So. That's one. <laughs> I could maybe speak from my, I've been in California for two years now, but I follow a lot of um, organizations oriented, there's specifically agroecology organizations, but also oriented towards farm workers. Um, and I think that that's a good place to start um, finding particular people working within the food system. Um, there's a lot of cool organizations in California and I'm sure um, out in upstate New York too, and maybe focusing specifically on those organizations that are um, uplifting indigenous and black and indigenous people of color. Great, and if anybody else have any recommendations, you can uh, write them on the chat uh, so that Andrea can, can look at them and, and get some really good recommendations also from all of you. Um, the next question is from Leo Mateo Bashirner, Bashinger, Bashinger, I'm sorry. And uh, he say, he's asking, um, after we heard a lot of reasons why the capitalist system is so persistent, how do you imagine we can push transformations in concrete ways? Say when working 
toward with local governments, local farmers, etc. Maybe I will address this uh, first to Katia, who hasn't um, a, a, a responded to any of the questions. So Katia, can you can you answer that question in the context of Puerto Rico, and then we can we can also ask others if they have anything else to say. Yvette, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Eric, but I have to leave. I have a doctor's appointment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we understand. So, 2.30. So, thank, thank you, everybody. And um, people can email me if they, if they want to continue the conversation on anything I said. Otherwise, I'm sure everybody here can give um, very uh, trenchant answers to whatever questions you have. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, thank, you, to our panel. thank you for coming. Okay, so um, Katia? Um, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this. I've <laughs> given up on the on on the state as we've as you know as, as the role of the government. I think at least some of the efforts that I've seen are successful, and there are actually uh, quite a few of them are in the Northeast U.S. To follow up on Andres' question. Um, talking about taking back land, such as the land trusts by people of color that are building up in the Northeast. And I think we need to work in several lanes. I usually kind of try to, I'm, I'm pretty boxed, boxy. <laughs> so I try, there's one lane obviously is getting rid of or transforming or creating public policy that allows people to survive. And that's, I think that's one of the basic ones that I mentioned in my talk. Um, and we can do that. We can do that with local municipal representatives. We can do that with farmers pushing and having, we've, we've had people, you know, mar farmers marching into the urban areas or the capital, et cetera, whatever is necessary to push a particular thing, lobbyists and, and sometimes uncomfortable but strategic alliances that need to happen for public policy to be pushed so that those resilient systems and projects can continue or build up and then there's a kind of an in between which is surviving in this in this gray area between outside and within the states like land trusts that are occurring but mostly building power i think sometimes we go too quickly into wanting to change US policy. And I read one of the comments was saying, well, is this going to be something about voting Democrat? Actually, no, I think I think at the end of the day, probably we need to overthrow the capitalist government. I mean, that's something that we can discuss later. But <laughs> in the end of the day, if we want to truly build resilience or build a food system that can, in fact, work with nature and people, we need to start small and we need to create small nuclei of power for our farmers, our producers, and not just focused on food, but focused on the entire system that sustains what we eat, both for our bodies, mind and soul. So, and, and to do that, we need to put resources in the hands of people. And that sometimes means if you're inheriting a piece of land, donating it to a land trust, donating it to a or local organization, local farm, starting to support, and, and Eric mentioned voting with your fork. I don't think it's necessarily voting with your fork, but instead of going to the supermarket, go to the farmer's market. Make sure that you know someone that is farming. Do the farming yourself and promote that people get to know that farming. I think that third lane is really important and that's the scaling small and connecting the community. That in and of itself is gonna start building a resistance that we so direly need. Um, and that would be, those are at least the three lanes that I think of when I think of how do we shift and make it better for everyone. Great. Farmers co-ops, Lina, but thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katia. And uh, I think we have just a few minutes left, but there's still, uh, uh, I think, a couple of, squ of questions that maybe we can address. Uh, Purva Chatterjee, uh, she's asking, uh, what would food prices look like in agroecology markets? I know organic produce is expensive and largely not affordable for the poor. Great question. Anyone wants to address that question? Any of the speakers? 
I can I can try, and I think it's really interesting the general idea that organic products are more expensive. I think it's a fall a false. Um, it tends to be a false argument, and I think it needs to be looked at deeper. I, I think the way that we we do research and from science from the people, I think you guys, if you have masters and doctoral students that are interested in this, that would be awesome. Um, I think in general, you have to look at what goes into the price of food. And I, um, Tania Korovsky spoke a lot about how in Ecuador, the politics actually created a false dichotomy in which the, it pitted the urban poor, which need lower and lower food prices against the farmers that are constantly in the need of increasing the price. And I think one of the, one of the main areas that we need to develop is what is that minimum? of necessary and definitely not everything is going to have a price that not not everything's going to have a dollar sign um and i i love that i've been able to see and i know that it has happened in the u.s so you guys can share your experiences but the exchanges that have happened without being able to go to the supermarket have not all been in in dollar signs and that's really important what does that mean what does it mean that we have that creek or that we have that bubbling brook nearby that is not riddled with pesticides or not euthropicized. I, I don't know if I said that word properly. Those things not, do not necessarily have a price tag, but if we were to actually put a real price tag, it probably would be even more expensive than it actually is. I think if we internalize the externalities, as Eric said, is as, as a suggestion and we have the real price, then we can start working from there. And I think it would be a really interesting example. What does an organic carrot really cost as opposed to saying or starting from the premise that it is expensive and then work backwards. Okay, so this organic carrot with all that it implies, which is sustaining a farming community, it means preparing the soil, it means sustaining the soil, it, mean re it means restoring the soil, probably it means reclaiming cultural knowledge, reclaiming power and spaces. Well, this, this one carrot is $25 if it were to be monetized strictly. Then how do we work from that? What can we do in exchange? What does that mean for the communities that are producing and consuming it? I think starting from the premise that it is expensive, is, is, it, it sets up and it pits us into a false dichotomy. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that once one, having that floor, knowing what the true value is for that production. And I had one more thought and it escaped me again. So <laughs> if it comes back, I'll jump in. But there well, was that, that's fine because we are out of time. Uh, it's already 6.46. Uh, we extended 15 more minutes. Uh, there are still uh, several questions that are left in, in the chat. I will encourage the speakers to look at the questions and maybe if you can answer people. Uh, but maybe this means that we have to do another teaching some other time. <laughs> so uh, with that, I just want to thank our four speakers uh, very much. It was very interesting. Uh, it, looking at a lot of different aspects of agroecology with uh, uh, examples from and from Mexico and Puerto Rico as well as the United States. And I hope that this has been uh, an interesting and informative teaching for those of you who, who didn't know much about agroecology and even for those of you who do, did know about agroecology. And uh, with that, I think I want to, uh, I don't know if David wants to say any final words to yeah. Our audience. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it to David. David, thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, I need to mute. Okay, there's a feedback. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Yvette, uh, for moderating. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, and the panelists for um, giving amazing speeches and contributions. This was a really great um, discussion and panel. So I just wanted to highlight real quick that we have our next teaching come up, which will focus on art and design uh, for a Green New Deal uh, on November 19th in the Zoom chat. You will find the links to sign up. Um, uh, the, the Zoom will stay on for a little longer. So, you know, whoever can stay on can just go through the links that are in the Zoom chat. There are plenty, um, as well as continue the discussion for 
a um, few more minutes, say 10 or so. So yeah, that's all. Thanks again, everybody for contributing and um, for an amazing panel. And yeah, keep, the go keep up the good work onwards and upwards. Thank you, David. Thank you, Yvette. Yes. Thank, Thank you for all of you. Me.